Welcome to this episode of John's Journal. And we're going to continue to go through um, Nicholas Cresswell and join him together with another very, very interesting, not a journal so much as a memoir from the 18th century that kind of has a, a very interesting and fun connection. So we're at the tail end of his uh, first adventure into the bush, and he's right around the Fort Pitt or Pittsburgh area after having been into uh, Kentucky. So they came back up the Kentucky River, um, actually down the Kentucky River and then up the Ohio, and they, they've made it back into this area of Pittsburgh. Sunday, July 8th, 1775. This morning, one Captain David McClure came here on his way to Wheeling. He behaves civilly and offers me a place in his canoe to Wheeling. Mr. Tilling and Bossiers uh, intend to go by land to Redstone, which isn't very far away. Tilling has always treated me with great respect and kindness. This poor man was once a lieutenant in the train of artillery, but broke at New York for lancing a colonel. <laughs> well, he's taken up a good tract of land on the Kentucky. O'Brien and I went to Captain McClure. One of his company shot two does, plenty of meat, a little bread, uh, got to Captain Rogers' plantation. The next day, Sunday, past Grave Creek and Juanita Creek, uh, got to Finn Castle in the evening. No soldiers here, but about eight men from the neighborhood, all drunk. Our company soon got in the same condition. A man uh, had got whiskey to sell. Captain Cressop's people joined them. In a short time, a general engagement uh, began. Uh, I got up into the loft and went to sleep. Uh, Monday, July 10th, 1775. Um, wanting, uh, waiting Captain McClure, who is going within a little way uh, of Mr. Shepherd's with a horse, um, will carry my baggage. Disagreeable companions fighting and quarreling. Common problem here. We're going to skip a couple days. Uh, left Mr. Shepherd's. Uh, rambled through the woods and wilds, shot a rattlesnake, which had like to have bit my horse. Uh, it was about eight, or four feet long, not eight feet long, four feet long, lodged at Campfish, Campfish Creek, uh, great scarcity of provisions. So still, still a problem. Uh, West, Augusta, uh, West Augusta County, Friday, July 14th. Left Catfish Camp, traveled over a great deal of fine land, but very thin, thinly inhabited, across uh, the, uh, the Monongahela River at Redstone Fort, where I lodged with one captain, no, with Thomas Brown, uh, listing the best riflemen that can be got to go to Boston under Captain Cressop for the humane purpose of killing the English officers. Confusion to the scoundrels. Here is a number of them here, and I, be and I believe suspect me being a spy, they ask me so many impertinent questions. Very much fatigued this day. Saturday, the next day, left Redstone after losing myself several times, got to Captain Thomas uh, Gist's, very kindly treated by Miss Nancy Gist, uh, an agreeable young woman who informs me that there have been two very severe engagements at Boston, a great number killed on both sides, forgot, forgot part of an elephant tusk at the fort. Sunday, uh, July 16th, went to Major Crawford's, delivered some letters, had for him, uh, gives me a bad account of the Boston affair, informs me Lord Dunmore has abdicated the government of Virginia and gone on board a man of war. Monday, July 17th, 70, 1775, left Major Cressops, crossed the Yaugahaney River and went to Mr. V. Crawford's in the evening, went to Captain Stevenson's to what they call a reaping frolic. Um, usually make a feast when they have got done uh, reaping, very merry. And uh, Tuesday, July 18th, 1775, at V. Crawford's Jake, uh, Jacob's Creek, these rascals have worn out all my clothes. I, I left here so that I am now reduced to three ragged shirts, two pair of linen breeches in the same condition, a hunting shirt, a jacket, and one pair of stockings. Uh, so, uh, key notes as we have flown through this um, 
um, not only 10 days or so in his journal. Um, so he is in this area where this thinly inhabited. It's still easy to get lost. There's still a problem with provisions here and there, quarreling people. Uh, you know, his group gets back to this spot and uh, alcohol becomes available. And then, whew, you know, everybody gets drunk. They all start fighting. Uh, you know, he's like, I'm out of here. I'm leaving. Um, and, you know, still the idea of, you know, here he is. Here he has been. I don't know. He's, he has letters to deliver for someone um, I, he doesn't say when he got these letters. Was it letters he picked up all, maybe all the way back in uh, Kentucky? Uh, and he's delivering them now. You know, the mail service out here is is very, very, um, it's just, you know, uh, haphazard. There is no such thing as a true mail service. If somebody needs to send a letter, they try to find somebody that's going that, dire that direction and they, you know, kind of send it on that way. Um, I, it's hard for us to imagine a mail service that would be quite as um, unofficial uh, as that. But I kind of wanted to stick here with this last reading. He gets back to where he has left clothing. If you remember way back when he started, he left behind his clothing in a, in a chest. Well, people got into his, his chest and they just wore his clothes. Um, they wore them out. So this has only been a little bit of time. Uh, you know, he left at the beginning of April. You know, it's July now, three months later. People have gone in and borrowed his clothing and worn them out. <laughs> and clothing's really, really expensive. And in this place, really, really hard to come by. In fact, so hard to come by but that you would borrow somebody's clothes and wear them out. All he has on... Uh, he, all he has is left three ragged shirts, two pair of linen breeches, a hunting shirt, a jacket, and one pair of stockings. And he's, he's, he's going to be embarrassed by this uh, later on. Now, this is, the, uh, this is a, a memoir of, uh, what's this gentleman's name? I used to remember it. Uh, William Morley. And it's titled The Infortunate. Yeah, there's spell spelling and, and whatnot. Well... My spelling is very much like 18th century spelling. You know, it's like, you know. Anyway, not unfortunate, the infortunate. And uh, this a man, he has a real problem. His, his, uh, his father wasn't too bad off. Um, he thinks he's going to, you know, live a pretty easy life. His father dies and the money, you know, disappears. I think it's, I can't remember. Um, I haven't, it's been a, a little while since I've read it. His mother, I think, has some control of it, and you know, he loses that. He, he bums around London for a while trying to figure out what's going to happen to him, and he ends up on, uh, you know, without any money, uh, in in real pro real straits, as we would say it, in real problems, and he 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 binds himself out as an indentured servant to go to the New World. And this is fairly early. I think it says 1720s. Uh, let me see if I can find the, um, the date here. Um, yeah, 1720s. Um, but let me read to this part where he's just, this is um, right at the time when he is, is going to uh, sign away seven years of his life. Or, or something like that. Um, he says, uh, he's, he, I'll, go, I'll back up to where he's talking to a person um, about this idea. I think he reads a poster and he, and he goes to talk to someone. Um, uh, a man accosted me in the following manner. Sir, said he, I have for some time observed you and fancy your condition of, of life is altered for the worse. And guess you have been in better circumstances, uh, but if you wish to take my advice, I'll make it my business to find out some way which may be of service to you. Perhaps you may imagine I have a design to inveigle you, uh, but I assure you I have none. If you will accept a mug of beer, I will impart what I have to propose to you. The man appearing sincere, like used car salesman, right? The man appearing sincere, I gave an ear to him. 
And, and here he's describing himself. I dressed at the time in a very odd manner. I had on a red rug coat, and rug is like a real thick uh, wool fabric at the time, uh, a red rug coat with black lining, black buttons and button holes, and black lace upon the pockets and facings. An old worn out tie wig, which had not been combed out for above a fortnight, an unshaven beard, a torn shirt, and that had not been washed for above a month, bad shoes, and stockings full of holes. And then he goes on to say, uh, after he had shaved me, he proposed to me an American voyage and said there was a ship at Limehouse Dock that would sail for Pennsylvania in three or four days. Sir, said I, a person like me, oppressed by Dame Fortune, need not care where he goes. All places are alike to me. And I am very willing to accept your offer. His description of his clothing, you know, he goes into great detail about this, this coat, which is probably, at, at least at one time, a very fine coat with lace on, on it and lining and nice buttons and, and, you know, lining around the buttonholes. This was a high-end coat. And yet, uh, here he is wearing uh, a, a ripped and torn shirt underneath it. He doesn't mention any waistcoat there. Uh, he's got a worn-out hair, which, you know, his wig probably doesn't have any powder on it, so it's looking very rough. Uh, he's got an unshaven beard. Uh, so he is not shaved, which at the time beards were not the fashion. So this is, he's looking rough. Here he has on this, what used to be, maybe still is a fairly nice coat, but the rest of him is totally rough looking. You would say, you know, he probably was looking homeless at this, at this point. And he was, uh, bad shoes, stockings full of holes. Clothing matters. Clothing matters a lot uh, to most people in this time period. Unless you're on the very edge of the frontier, you are adhering to a fairly strict sense of clothing. And even on the frontier, your clothing is going to say a lot to other people. And your clothing still says a lot about you. Although today, you know, people kind of hide behind a casual clothing, right? Even it's like rich people. Um, will kind of hide behind some kinds of casual clothing at, at sense. But, you know, even then, the casual clothing is really, really nice, right? Um, but, uh, you know, he was embarrassed, the unfortunate, morally, he was embarrassed by his clothing at the time, undoubtedly. Uh, even what, what's the first thing this person does? Uh, he doesn't even say, he doesn't even talk about feeding him necessarily. But he talks about shaving him. He paid to have uh, his his beard shaved so that you would feel more comfortable. Now, now that you feel comfortable, maybe fed and definitely uh, groomed properly, now let's talk about this offer uh, that I have you, how to, how to really ingratiate yourself with someone. Uh, Nicholas Cresswell, here his clothing is all worn out. All he has is, you know, the stuff he's been wearing in the bush uh, all this time, and he is just I'm sure he was like, oh, I can't wait to get back to my chest. I'll put on a nice new shirt. I'll get out my nice clean pants. You know, maybe I got a coat and what, what? <laughs> Someone has broken into my chest and worn out all my clothing. He's very upset uh, and he doesn't have any money and maybe even not any good place to, you know, uh, place to get new in this circumstance. So he's going to be embarrassed by that as we go on in a few days or, or a while. He's looking like a, a ragged wild man uh, from the back country. Now well, they're used to it where he's at right now, but in a little while, uh, he's going to be back in more of a civilized situation and it's going to really, uh, you know, kind of go, go. He's going to be very uh, unhappy with his, his looks in the near future. Really interesting uh, connecting up these two and we would probably find other parallels with situations where people are concerned about um, how they look to the outside world. It was very, very important and um, a way you communicated about who you were in that time period, just like the way we communicate today. Have a wonderful day.